to the dermis. In the rim, I just stay very deep. I, I think that a lot of people I've talked to have had long-term issues when they get really close to the skin and they get really try to get close to the ciliary margin. Uh, I, I don't think that, you know, if you certainly don't have long-term problems with that, then that's great. I just, I've become very cautious uh, talking to my colleagues about doing that. I stay very deep, and the thing that I like is to try to go against the rim perpendicularly. If you try to attack it from a lateral side, I think you have a much harder time creating a result that's safe. And the, the refinement, I would say, as I move over, I just, now what I've been doing is more and more entry points across the lower, lower lid. As the rim is angular in nature, as I go over to the lateral canthus, this uh, drawing is actually, this photo is actually a little out of date. I'll go all the way laterally and aim toward the lateral canthus. Really, where I'm trying to think about the face from an aging perspective is an idea of transition points. And I believe that unifying the transition from the upper eyelid brow to the lower eyelid is that juncture of the lateral canthus, and even further laterally, I'll just swing my cannula and enter laterally to create almost a unified upper eyelid brow. So limiting the transition from the, a distinct upper and lower eyelid is one of the refinements I've made in the last year. The nasal jugal groove, I don't put a lot into it. I put very little, probably 0 0.2, 0 0.3 cc's. I don't like putting a ton of uh, volume into that area. I just want to be conservative. The brow, to me, is an extension of the uh, upper eyelid. I really look at it as a confluence. Again, thinking of, of zones of transition. So a lot of people distinguish that as just saying putting fat up here. But I also like just transitioning all the way up to the upper eyelid itself and allowing you to see that break point where the skin hangs over the orbital rim and goes into that cavity. I like to transition over the area and I think it works well. The Predictability in brow augmentation is not always there. Sometimes you get a little loss in that region. The anterior cheek, I think the main key is when you're going across regions that you need to, to, to that have linear defects, it's much easier to approach it from a perpendicular perspective. So as you know, the malar ligament runs in this direction. I find it much easier to approach it by depositing fat perpendicular to the malar ligament and building it up in that plane from deep to superficial rather than parallel in nature. The lateral cheek, I, I do really, as you start to do fat grafting, your art begins to become more heightened. You start to see all these little places. So it's not just throwing some fat in the cheek or throwing some fat under the eyes. These little tiny areas start to become more and more important. And, and to me, I, I, I look at the cheek as anterior cheek, lateral cheek, central buccal zones, areas where there's a little dental hollow, called the, I call the medial buccal hollow, the subzygomatic region where you get hollow, and you start to see all these little transition points, and you start to see negative space. So we're going to talk more about that in a moment. The uh, buccal area, as I said, is not just one area. It's actually multiple small areas. And I really see a lot of the, almost two elements of depression across here, one underneath the lateral uh, malar eminence and one in the central area. And then there's this one that oftentimes sinks in when there's dental hollowing. And so rethinking the buccal area is not just throwing fat there, but really seeing before you're treating. The pregial sulcus is an area that has a three-dimensional cylinder. There's a component that falls below the mandible we heard earlier, not just anterior to the mandible, and then going around that entire confluence. So really looking at it as, a, as three cylinders, one in front of the mandible, one underneath the mandible, and then a transition point between the two. So framing the eye, it's almost the antithesis of traditional blepharoplasty, which is instead of taking away, but is, is adding. This is a, a conservative upper eyelid, plasma skin resurfacing, and a fat transfer. And you can see that what looks so clearly as a brow ptosis may not be if you just add a little volume around the right places, under the eyes and around the, and I, that's how I manage uh, skin issues under the lower eyelids, is resurfacing and Botox rather than cutting, just to be absolutely conservative. This is my mother, about two years out from fat transfer. She also had a transfer or bluff, and you can see that. It was interesting, I was looking at some of her old photos, and her brows are actually fuller and lower in some of them. And, and so there's this hollowing where there's a recession of the, of the fat and skin upwards into the brow orbital rim. This is a lady that had a blepharoplasty in upper eyelid on the left, and you can see this very vacuous look at 41. For example, this woman, who's had a brow lift and facelift, has a very, very large cheekbone. So what I did was to de-emphasize this, is focus on the anterior cheek and focus on the central buccal zone to bring that into harmony with the lower face. And this is a great example of lowering the jawline just with fat. And this is a lady, if you look at her old photograph, you can see the transition in, uh, of the cheek into the buccal zone into the anterior chin, which creates a very soft look. This lady here, you can see a lot of correction in the lower face as well and some lip enhancement and a little bit of upper eyelid bluff you can see the balance of the upper cheek into the buccal zone, into the anterior chin. 
Restoring identity, people that have been overlifted. How do you, you know, unlift someone? When you put volume back in, there's a lady that had very large cheek implants, um, and I took those implants out and then sculpted the face. It's certainly not perfect, but it's bringing that buckle zone into harmony with the cheek. So just don't think you need to have a large cheek. There's a lady with a very over-articulated brow, and just focusing on that transition point over the orbital rim, you can see that the brow just doesn't look quite as heavy, or, or sorry, quite as high, and you bring it down a little bit with volume, creates very good balance. There's a lady here that didn't want to have her cheek implants removed. Obviously, these are large ones. People that use cheek implants probably use much more conservative ones and not positioned this way. And this is just adding volume back around the eyes, the cheeks, and the chin and to offset the implant. Evolution of volume, what occurs, with, what, what occurs with fat over time? And what I've really started to see is that there, fat doesn't have a linear change. It actually, it looks too swollen, then it dips, and then you're temp tempted to go back and add more fat, and then it actually gets better. And I use a model of, because I do a lot of hair restoration, and you'll hear my talk in a few moments, and this is where I've been thinking about it. And so what you see initially is you see a, a gross amount of edema early on. But then there's this dip that may or may not occur, and then there's improvement over time. And then over about three to four years, there's a little bit of dip. And at that point, sometimes I use a little wrestling just to touch it up with one syringe. So the concept is why. And so I've looked at hair restoration as my model. And what I found, which is really interesting in Unger's book, is that you know, through a process early on of primary, primary and secondary inosculation, you have some degree of hold of the fat. But the fat is not very, very obvious. At three months, when the fat cells can shrink a little bit, you may get a more obvious dip. Obviously, what's different from a hair restoration is there's no hair growth early on, but the fat, the edema that's there can mimic volume. But as that starts to subside, you start to see changes over time where the fat actually matures and gets better. And I think that break point is about six months. It's extremely similar to a hair transplant. When neovascularization is established around six months out, you start to have ongoing improvement up to about 18 months. And that's where I want to sort of walk you through some photographs to, to show you this uh, probably more graphically. This is a lady at 48 years old who had um, some uh, IPL injuries. She had some uh, facelift to try to rectify that, it didn't succeed. This is a fat transfer at one week with some bruising. This is at one month, slightly cheeky, slightly full, but not too bad. And then at three months, that actually is not much dip. I'm gonna show you some people that dip and don't dip. And I actually think she has a slight dip at six months where there's a little bit of a drop. But the temptation at this point is, oh, my fat is going away. Let's go back and stuff that face with more fat. I think you get real problems down the road with that. And so if you look as we follow forward, 11 months, it's restoring itself. And then at 15 months, it actually looks about right. And I see a cap point between 18 months to two years. Just like when I do hair restoration, I see a lot of changes with that where sometimes the hair looks the best at a year, sometimes it looks best at 18 months, sometimes I see already a vibrant growth at six months, and sometimes I see a vibrant growth at three months. And that's evolution of understanding a micrograph. This is a 40-year-old lady, this is a week out, a slight degree of bruising, slight, it looks more youthful, but it's quite full. This is a significant dip. This is one of my most significant dips at three months. And the temptation is to see this and go, my fat didn't work. Let's go back and stuff more fat in there. I think that's a real problem. And this is about a year later, and you can see almost, and this is all taken with the same camera, same distance, same lighting, in the same room with no ambient lights and no flash. And it shows you the idea that there is changes over time. This is a lady that is one month out from a fat transfer, not bad. And I don't think she goes through much dip at three months, and not everyone does, but if you don't prepare your patients at three months for a possible dip, you and they will be doing some more fat transfer, which would be very dangerous. And this is nine months out, and it's starting to blend, one year out, and then two years out. And again, this is not multiple touch-ups, this is not wrestling, this is not anything else, this is one single fat transfer. This is the book I wrote, and I appreciate your time today. This is my contact information if you need it. Thank you.